Please keep in your prayers Father Juan Carlos Iscara. He's our professor at the seminary, now retired. He's now taken up residence in Phoenix. His health is not well. We don't know how much time he has left. The priests, the young priests, have been asked to anoint our reverend professor. Father Iscara has been about 36 years a priest. And we need to pray for his good health and his good end if he's called to it. I certainly appreciate him as my professor for five years of history, uh, five years of liturgy, etc. And he's been there for about 30 years he's been in the seminary. So please pray for his soul. Please pray for his good health. And please pray for other young men to step forward to replace our sick priests. I mentioned them, and now I even found out another of our young priests who's only 40 years old has now been diagnosed with lymphoma also. So our priests are taking on a heavy burden of health and often close to death, and we can't afford to lose those priests. And we don't have all the young men necessarily to replace them, at least not for seven years. Pray for your priests. Pray for the good health. Pray that others follow. Pray that others are so generous. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady, help of Christians. It's good to invoke Our Lady under different titles, and I invoke her under this title, Our Lady, help of Christians, today with the children here present because she was quite the patroness and help to John Bosco, the St. John Bosco, who ran his school for boys, an orphanage for boys. And for what purpose? What purpose did he run his schools and collect all these little urchins from the streets in order that they may save their souls? And we know how important is the education the parents give that the church gives through her schools, through catechism, or through actual school days. Why? For the purpose of focusing the children upon God, focusing the children upon our Lord Jesus Christ, so that they may save their souls. You can imagine at the time when the conditions were often very, very poor compared to what we know in the times of Italy at, during John Bosco's time, Oh, just ab abject poverty and, and sins and misuse of children and who knows what. So many terrible things. And he was going around trying to save these kids, these boys especially in this case, and bring them to the faith, to keep them in the faith. How concerned was St. John Bosco about children? Remember the story of the little boy who had one mortal sin on his soul and I had a hard time confessing it because he was ashamed. And that brought John Bosco to tears that the young boy would not go to confession and confess his sin. He knew it. John Bosco knew these things by reading hearts and souls and the different things that God allowed him to know. And then the boy died in the state of sin. And he knows he went to hell. And it so tore him up inside. Imagine the effort, the earnestness he made to work with children, to keep them from sin, to keep them in the faith. And that should be our concern also, dear faithful. I, it is for me. It is for my staff, the academy staff. And it should be for all of us, whether we're now, grandparents or single, or whether we're the parents of these children in front of us or any children, we should be very concerned about the faith of the child, of its moral standing with God, that it be free from sin. And what's going to help us to be free from sin, but then to know the truth? It's not, it's, it's not sufficient to say, that's wrong, don't do it. That may work with little children. But if you don't have a goal to reach for, you're gambling the whole time, always running up to the edge of morality, falling into sin, going back to the confessional. And you just keep that cycle. But what kind of growth is that? 
in a soul. And that's a gamble, as St. Alphonsus Liguori would say. We only have one soul. If we had multiple souls, we could expend them as we like. We could go commit the worst sins. Oh, I lost that one. Okay, check one soul off. It's gone. Now I got nine left. And all the way down, you know, I wouldn't even want to do that because you know what that would mean if I had nine souls, that, ten souls that I could just expend as I like, sin as I like, and throw into hell? But I'm saying to myself, I'm only going to keep, I'll keep that one sacred. No, we wouldn't. Because we never practice with the other souls. Yet, forget that. We don't have ten souls. We only have one. Only one soul. And you men and women who have children and families, you may have multiple souls under you that have to go to heaven. Imagine that burden of responsibility. Now, maybe you'd come to understand my burden of responsibility to get 500 people or 1,500 people into heaven that I have to look after in Southern California. And that each one of those I will be held accountable for. Somehow. God will have to ask me. What did you do with that soul in Garden Grove that went to hell? What did you do for that soul? I should be able to list the things that were possible for me to do, and then I did them to the best of my effort. And then after that, they made their choice. Okay, says God, understood. But what if I couldn't say that? What if I said to him, I didn't want to talk to that soul. I didn't give it time for confession. I didn't try to direct it through catechism or through good sermons. I never told it it had to go to Mass or that it had to obey the commandments. And you know what's worst of all? God, I was a bad example to that soul. Then if I'm hopefully in a state of grace when I died, even though I had that soul against me because I didn't take care of it, I may have to spend a long time in purgatory. So souls are very important. One soul is very important. Our own. But imagine if somebody gives to us many souls, like you parents, myself as a priest, us as a school. We have so many souls to help guide to heaven that each one of us in inserting ourselves into that, I would call it, providence, inserting ourselves into that work of education, we all take on the responsibility, each according to his capacity, each according to his office. Who's the most responsible for the education of children? Dad and mom, the father and mother. After that, well, most likely it's the priests and the principals of schools, and then after that, those who have allied themselves with parents, such as teachers, they take on the responsibility. So you see, we're trying to help one another. Parents are trying to help their children. And then children are helping their parents. And then when they put the, the parents put the children at the disposal of the school, you're going to help me educate them, right? For the faith? Yes. Then we're trying to help the parents. And the church tries to help the parents. And yet you see how the students... Oh boy, the students could really harm their teachers and their parents if they said, I'm going to make this difficult. I'm not going to study. And I'm just going to pretend like I'm getting along. But I really don't want to be here. Imagine the burden that puts upon parents and teachers. They're supposed to be a, a working together, and yet one side is working against. And then that ups the ante, as we'd say, of the responsibility and who will be held responsible in the end. Christian education, the church has always looked after and it's very, it's very important to her. We can read about these things. and Unfortunately, in my sermon, would go on and on and on if I start quoting all of these different sources. But there are very beautiful books out there for parents and teachers to read 
what is Christian education and what is the proper way of disciplining or raising our children. Some of which I use to educate our parents when they come into marriage classes. We call them pre-cana classes, pre-canas. And the pre-canas help to prepare the couple to raise a family. And some of that is just the education of children, pointing out the basic things that we must not overlook. And I'm going to point out, I ask the forgiveness of the couples here who've heard me say this so many times, I'm going to point out some of these important responsibilities that we as priests, educators, so teachers and parents, must do for children, lest we be neglectful. Parents, and we help you with this, have the duty to love their children and care for them and educate them. Where else are they going to find it? You know, that was part of the bane and the worry of John Bosco is all these children, where are the parents? Where do the parents go? Why are these children on the street? Why are they abandoned and orphaned? So many children like that today. And even if we say, oh, there's my father and there's my mother, they're never together. Parents always working, never with their children. Children are lock-key children. They come in and out with their own key, left to their own devices. Is that a family life? Is that really loving the children and caring for the children and also educating them? Hardly. Sometimes we have defective children in our families. It's not a very politically correct thing to say today. But there may be defects in our children, both spiritual, mental, physical. And who's the most apt to look after that or to take care of them? The parents. And seeking the necessary help from doctors or educators or from priests. We still have to love those defective children. Oh, it's always nice to love the child who always says to the parents, Oh, I love you. Can I take your shoes? Do you want me to wash the table? Do you want me to vacuum? I did all my homework. Aren't I nice? So lovable. But what about the child who's not like that? Who seems to always challenge you. Are you going to love that one still as much as the others? It's a challenge to love the defective child, the one who's not quite like you, not doing what you want. We must never forget they are children. They can be molded. They can be directed. They can be polished. We will love them all, and we will care for them all, and we will educate them all according to their capacity. That's another thing that takes a little bit of ingenuity. We don't just educate every child the same. Yes, there's a general education that everyone should receive. But then you see, according to the children's capabilities, the child's capabilities, we will see what they're capable of, how much they can take, how much they can't, certain places they study better, certain ways they study better. Parents then must care for the bodily things of the child, the mental state of the child. They must look after their spiritual care and their religious instruction. And there's one aspect that I don't want to overlook, and it's called discipline. And if I could encourage all of the parents here today, and any one of us who wishes to know more about discipline of children, is to get a hold of and demand from Angelus Press to be able to listen to Father Robinson's conference on discipline that he gave at the Angelus Press Conference back in October. And he says the problem of today with a lot of us, whether it be educator or parent, is we're very permissive, meaning we want to be equal with our children, but that's not helping them. When has any one of us advanced in confidence and capabilities by being equal to someone? It's not the case. I am a child. I was born into a family. I have parents. And I look to the parents and I say, look what dad can do. Look what mom can do. I can't do that yet, but 
that someday I will. I'm not equal to them. They're going to show me what to do. They're going to encourage me on the right path. And I will eventually be able to do what they do, and maybe even greater, greater things and greater capabilities I may have. That's a plus. That's a grace. It is normal. So don't neglect the discipline of the child. Even though you have so many cares, the child requires discipline. They're happier with that. They're happier when mom and dad say, do this good, don't do that bad. Directing them. What about this bodily care? There is a proper balance, isn't there, between too much pampering and spoiling and then too, too little care so they can't do the basic things or they feel odd, they feel put out because they can't even just function. So the parents have to have a real balance with the bodily care of their children. I know some children are neglected in their families because there are a few, fam- a few members to the family, maybe a few children, and you just can't give every one single one enough time individually. So then we start to rush around, and some of the children start to get neglected. So it's so important to have a structure and a program. I call it the pillars of the family. In order that everybody knows that these things always happen, and then we move around those and through them. Children need security. They need to know that things are stable. Every one of us does need that. The missionaries figured that out real quick at helping the natives of the land to keep their faith. They had to be stable. They couldn't be nomadic. They had to be stable. They had to farm. They had to look after things. They had to clothe themselves. They had to look after their bodily cares, and then it was easier to hold on to the faith. It's not about spoiling. It's not about materialism. It's the basic needs of an individual so he can feel calm and peace, and then he can pursue the faith with ease and not be thinking, what am I going to eat next? Children always do that enough. What am I going to eat next? We're starving here. Starving? And being hungry shouldn't be the focus of a mind that is trying to elevate itself. And the missionaries figure that out, especially the Jesuits. And even the Franciscans figured out very quick, we need to give these souls stability in order that they may advance in their faith. Such is the case with your your homes. You need to know that your children have the basic needs of a child so they feel the security and they feel like they can advance with confidence without having to worry, whoa, is my bed going to be gone tomorrow? Am I going to have food? I better not leave this place. I better not let go of the clothes I have because I may not have them. Fears. Children are set up with fears very early on because of the parents. First, the parents cause the fear in the children. And there shouldn't be that fear. Yes, tragedies happen, difficulties happen, different cultures, different parts of the world are different. It's true. But we will do our best to give the children stability so that they may pursue their studies, pursue the truth, pursue their faith. I want to say something about the mental stability of a child, the mental training of a child. Children today have to grow up so fast. And do they? That's my question to you. We allow it. We allow children to become so mature in their mind, even though their bodies can't keep up. We, get, we expose them to so many things that you and I, 50 years ago, didn't have to worry about. They're exposed to so much because, as you know, we can receive in- information instantaneous through so many devices and so many means. We have so many other people around us who are so keen educated, if you want to call it that, so knowledgeable about things of the world that a little child often starts to pine away in their heart, worrying about whether Russia's going to nuke us. 
whether there's going to be food in the grocery store, whether mom and dad will stay together. They're going to get divorced, they said. (gasps) Do they have to worry about those things? Should they have to worry about those things? Should we be instilling fear in them like that? No. No, they need to know their life. And we need to make them very stable in it. And the mental strain that is put upon children today is incredible. Incredible. Keep them simple and happy, secure. Do your best for that. We need to make certain that they're mentally stable and balanced in their 30s. Because what happens in their youth will come back around to affect them when they're 30 and 40 years old. I can tell you that's true for me. Maybe for any one of you who, as you get older, you start to recall things that happened when you were a baby, a child. Things coming back, recalls, so often, so frequently. That you say, whoa, no wonder I do those things because of that. The spiritual care, the religious instruction... You've heard enough from priests and from sermons to know that the the daily prayer in the family is so important, especially the rosary. The rosary really is very close to the child's heart. The mysteries of our Lord, the mysteries of Our Lady, those are the things that a child loves. And why is it that a child will start to get jaded, belligerent about prayer? Because it's never been taught to love it. It's just a chore. It's just another thing to do. It's not a divine life or a communication with God for them. It's just another chore. And then they start to fight the parents as they grow up through the teenage years. And the parents just say, okay, you don't want to pray? Get out of here. I don't want to see you. It all starts very young. Very young, the spiritual and religious training of a child starts in the womb of the mother. It starts in the arms of the mother when she's holding the baby. And when the baby's walking and starting to talk, all of that is first starting with the mother, followed through by the father, and hopefully by us as priests and educators and schools, teaching them to love their faith. And I was just preaching a retreat, and this is a common question by fathers. Father Burfitt, how do we keep our children in the faith? And my reoccurring constant answer is, make certain that the child has blood, sweat, and tears invested in the church. It has to be real for them. They can't live in a virtual world of, oh, we we pray at home and we do our thing, but as soon as we leave the house, it's a free-for-all. You do what you like. Or we come to church on Sundays, and after that, it's a free-for-all. You just do what you like. You just have to be good on Sundays. That's not invested in the faith. So I told the man who was asking me, a very good man with a good family, and he's trying to figure this out for his sons because his sons, his sons are now in their teenage years and he doesn't want to lose them. He doesn't want them to get distracted. And he sees the difference between the oldest son and the ones following. The oldest one wanted to serve Mass. He wanted to be part of the parish. And the others, laziness. And he's saying, what do I do with them? What can I do for them? And I said, bring them to the work days. Have them serve. Put them in the choir. Have them go out of themselves to do something for somebody else. A nursing home. Their grandparents. Anything like that that says, I am doing this for Christ. I'm coming outside of myself to do it for someone else. It's so important. And you put your blood, sweat, and tears in that effort, and it's real. It's not virtual. It's not a fake. It's not put on. So important. Boys' camps. 
girls' camps, very important for the youth. They need to be around the priests and religious, even as infrequent as that can, is. They need to see that the faith is lived. They need to see that the priest is a man, that the priest is a man who's striving for holiness, and that God goes with him, that he's still on two feet, <laughs> not flying around uh, with two wings. Another part of education, which can be a very delicate matter for the parents, is this whole question of the mysteries of life. The parents and children must learn according to their degrees of knowledge, their degrees and capabilities of learning. Father Beck spoke about this at the Angelus Press also. It's a good conference to listen to, teaching your children about the mysteries of life. What does that mean, that the modern education system thinks that they can take that over from parents. And Pius XII and the bishops of the United States spoke on this, saying it is the responsibility of the parents to teach children about the facts of life. Nobody else. And if they don't do it, they sin gravely, as they would on any education. The parent deliberately refuses to educate their children on what the children should know that's a sin. Oh, I was too scared about it. I didn't know much about it myself. Then you learn. And you learn to be virtuous. A virtuous man can convey anything to another in a virtuous manner. But if we lack that strength and we ourselves are fearful and we don't have the virtue, what's going to happen next? Neglect. Failure. People will be neglected. We can't do that. So be a spiritual parent. You children, support your parents and the efforts that your parents make for you and then also support this little school of Our Lady of the Angels. I, I think of all the beautiful fruits that have come, marriages, vocations to the religious and priestly life. Whatever it is, we're very grateful for Monsignor Donahue and Father Ward the founders of these very important institutions, our church and the school. We're, we're grateful to Our Lady of the Angels, our patroness. We want to be very spiritual, that's to say religious in our practices, to keep up this fidelity. And it's not just a put-on, as I say. It has to be substantial. It has to be some kind of investment. And then we'll never lose it. I offer this Mass for all of you today, and so the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is the most profitable, most fruitful thing we can do in any part of our day. Everything flows from it. We will not lose anything by coming to the Mass and receiving from our Lord His precious body and blood, the ultimate sacrifice of God for men. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen.